Hi, everyone, and welcome for uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Our uh, first speaker today is going to be Nick Anderson. So Nick is currently a 2021 CANAFS fellow working in the National Fish Passage Coordination uh, Specialist in the Habitat Protection Division of NOAA Fisheries Office of Habitat Conservation. His passion for ecology and diatomus and the freshwater fish led him to pursue a bachelor's in marine and freshwater biology and then a master's in natural resources from the University of New Hampshire. His master's research focused on eelgrass monitoring methods and the assessment of eelgrass beds in James Bay, Quebec. Nick has previously worked as a backcountry hut caretaker, NOAA's fishery observer, and carpenter. And in his free time, he enjoys all cold weather activities like Nordic skiing, hiking, ice fishing, and ice cream. Uh, and he enjoys spending time with his partner and, of course, fishing. So without further ado, Nick, take it away. Thank you, Kim. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll be sharing a little of my master's work, as Kim described, um, from James Bay on developing an index for assessing eelgrass health um, from field work in James Bay. And before starting, I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors here from the University of New Hampshire. Without their participation, support, and guidance, uh, this would not have been possible. All right, so the presentation, I will start with an overview and background on the work. Um, then I will get into the focus of the research, the Eelgrass Health Index, which I'll refer to as the EHI or index interchangeably. Um, and that has two parts, um, the validation of the index and then its application. And I will wrap up today with some concluding remarks. So my research project, or this project, really begins with the Cree. Um, the Cree are Canadian First Nations people from northern Quebec. They inhabit the James Bay region or EUSG territory of the province, as highlighted here in green on the right map. Um, and our research was focused in four area, the four coastal Cree communities, starting at the north with Chassabee, then to Wominji, East Main, and Wiscaganish. And now the Cree are hunters and fishers, or as they call themselves, trappers, and have been so for millennia. Um, both hunting and fishing are central to their culture and identity. And of particular importance to the Cree are geese, as depicted in the symbols up here in the upper left. Um, uh, all four symbols have geese in them, some more prominently than others. And uh, the, uh, so the geese, um, migrate north in the spring and south in the fall and use the coastal waters of James Bay off the Cree territory as feeding and resting grounds. And during this time, the Cree take vacation from work and go out on goose break to hunt in the bay and harvest geese. However, the Cree have observed a major decline in the eelgrass beds uh, and with it, the brant geese they hunt have nearly disappeared and Canada geese are fewer and fewer every year. Um, so with the loss of eelgrass, what is eelgrass? Eelgrass is just one species of seagrass. Seagrasses are a group of 70 plus marine plants. They're very similar to terrestrial or land-based plants. They have roots and rhizomes for anchoring. Um, they produce energy through photosynthesis and they reproduce through flowers, pollen, and seeds. But what makes them really unique is that seagrasses do all of that underwater in shallow marine and coastal environments. They really are incredible. Um, healthy eelgrass beds are highly charismatic in just how expansive they are, how large and lush the plants can be, and the sheer amount of life that they can support. And the video you see here is just an eelgrass bed um, from Great Bay, New Hampshire. And uh, so eelgrass is the most widely distributed species of seagrass in the Northern Hemisphere with a circumpolar range. Um, and seagrasses uh, as a whole, they only cover a small fraction of 1% of the ocean, but in doing so, they are a huge uh, resource. They provide a nursery habitat for more than 20% of major commercial fisheries. They improve water quality and improve uh, coastal resilience. And they are also estimated to be responsible for 10% uh, of organic carbon stored in marine environments. 
So really provide a significant amount of ecosystem services for us as people. Uh, now for the bad news though. Globally, seagrasses are in decline, including eelgrass. Um, it's the usual suspects, pollution, habitat destruction, invasive species are all causes of sea de seagrass decline. In James Bay, the Cree observed a major decline in the eelgrass beds from the 1990s to about 2000, which has been documented by the Canadian hydropower utility Hydro-Quebec, as well as in reports from Short and Dickey. And there are many hypotheses to why it's in decline. Um, a few of the ones listed here that are most likely are uh, isostatic uplift with glacial recession and permafrost melt. The land is beginning to rise. And with that, coastal land is um, getting shallower and maybe reducing eelgrass habitat. Another is wasting disease. Um, in the 1930s, uh, wasting disease caused by marine slime mold decimated eelgrass populations along the eastern seaboard and now is ubiquitous throughout eelgrass beds uh, to some extent. Uh, a third one is hydro development. Um, so Quebec produces nearly all of its energy through hydropower and 50% of that electricity is generated in the James Bay region. Um, in order to do this, they've created a number of large reservoirs as well as um, diverted water between watersheds. So certain rivers have less water flow delivered where they used to while there is a lot more flow coming out of other watersheds further to the north. And this may be having a negative impact on water temperatures, salinity, and light penetration, all significant factors uh, contributing to eelgrass survival and health. And finally, climate change may also be having a multiplying effect on any of these threats and stressors, exacerbating them ever so much more. So to really try to determine the cause of eelgrass, eelgrass decline in James Bay, we need to understand the health status across the Bay. And in order to do that, we elected to use an ecological indices. Um, they are a good method for assessing seagrass health and have been used prior to now. And an index really is just an indicator or a method for measuring something. It is generally used in Western science. Indices can also look at a single variable, such as wasting disease, or at multiple variable, variables and combine them into one meaningful number. Uh, in my review of indices, I pulled out six that may have been usable for what we were trying to do. Um, however, after reviewing them, none of these really worked for what we wanted. We wanted to focus specifically on one species, so a species status indices, as the two described here in the middle of the table, would it work well. However, neither of these were designed um, for eelgrass, let alone in North America. And another fact is that we wanted to make sure that it was um, accessible and not too intensive. So limiting the number of variables and making sure it was information that could easily be, easily be gathered. So we opted to design a new index to assign, uh, assess eelgrass health. And so uh, my research objectives were one, to develop an index for assessing eelgrass health using non-destructive and accessible observation methods and analysis. Second was to make sure it works um, by validating the index. And we did this using two methods, biomass and experiential knowledge. And finally, if it works, we were going to apply it, the index to assess the current health status of eelgrass trend and trends in James Bay. Now, James Bay is a pretty unique place for monitoring. Uh, collecting the data to go into the index itself was a challenge because the bay is huge. It's the size of West Virginia, and we were only focusing on the Quebec coastline, which is in itself several hundred kilometers north to south, and that's only uh, if you're in a straight line. That doesn't include the varied coastline of points, islands, river mouths, tons of potential habitat where eelgrass could be growing. Another factor is that James Bay is a subarctic environment. Um, the bay freezes over entirely in the winter and has co ice cover well into May and sometimes June, while at the end of the season, in late summer, early fall, uh, conditions get to be pretty stormy. So it's, you have a very narrow window to actually be out there during peak eelgrass growing season. Uh, now, 
The Cree have also been monitoring the coastal environment using their own methods for a long time, and they share this information across generations. However, it's largely an oral history, um, so there is a need to document it, but it is just um, a, their method and another method of understanding the coastal processes in eelgrass health. But for um, the work we were doing and I focused on for my research, we needed something different. So developing this index to uh, assess eelgrass was our priority. And to collect this data, we also had to develop some uh, new video monitoring methods. Um, generally, you get in the water to count the eelgrass, scuba, snorkel, or wading. However, water temps, even in the best of times, were quite cold. So we have this eelgrass uh, monitoring apparatus on the left, or simply just a GoPro on a painter's pole and a white disc at the end. And we developed these methods and then tested them for collecting data on eelgrass percent cover, so the area of eelgrass in an image, as you see here on the right, shoot density, how many shoots are in that set area or individual plants, and plant height, how tall those leaves are getting up to uh, at their peak. Um, and so we developed these methods and then validated them using uh, conventional video monitoring methods from the global seagrass monitoring network, SeagrassNet. And I won't go into that in detail today, but what we found was that there was um, a significant correlation and we were very confident moving forward with the data we collected to include in our index. So uh, going out onto the bay to collect all this data, we worked closely with the Cree and monitored close to 400 sites in 2017 and 2018. 230 of those sites uh, had eelgrass present as depicted with the black dots here on the right side uh, and the other sites in white dots, eelgrass was absent. And of those 230, 58 were suitable for analysis um, in our study because uh, we wanted it to be during a very narrow uh, range of timing uh, to catch peak eelgrass season and also to make sure growth hadn't changed much over that period for comparison. So we also wanted to make sure that we had enough video to collect frames from and then the quality of the video was clear enough that we could see what we uh, were observing. So from the video we collected still images like this. Uh, we do a drift transect across an eelgrass bed, take video, from that video, we isolate 10 still frames that were unique and uh, use those for observing percent cover, shoot density, and plant height. And these are just examples of the rep representative images we sampled and showing the variety of states eelgrass was in in James Bay. Using the information on cover density and height we pulled from those videos, we put it into a geometric mean equation to calculate the eelgrass health index. Uh, we, I opted to use a geometric mean because it's better for averaging values that may be correlated. For example, eelgrass shoots or taller plants would likely incre increase percent cover. Um, in the equation here, the numerator is our observed value, so what we pulled out of that frame, and the denominator is a reference value which was the average of the five best um, observations of that variable we took from the field. So we multiplied these together and then took the nth root, and that gave us uh, our EHI rating on a scale from zero to one, which then we scaled, adjusted to a zero to 100 scale for interpretation and accessibility. And then one note about this equation, it's plug and play. So you just need two types of variables to, variables to put in here in order to calculate an index rating. Um, so it could just be cover and density, or you could add on to it, um, say, disease cover of a leaf or leaf coloration. These could be plugged in and the index expanded. So the images I showed you before uh, were pulled because they had set rating or the index ratings uh, corresponded with the image. And when we applied them here, uh, we have a nice kind of gradient of what we saw. In the upper left, we have a very low rating of around 10 on the index, where eelgrass is almost absent. What's there is very small shoots. Um, as you move through the range, you see more shoots come into the screen. They get taller. You get a higher percent cover. And by the bottom right, you're up in a 80 on the index scale. Um, with really tall, thick, dense plants um, looking very healthy. Very encouraging in what we were doing. 
Um, I will note though, of all our observations, there was no perfect rating, no 100, um, and the maximum calculated rating we had was an 87. So we have developed, we've put together this index and we wanna make sure it works. So we want, had to validate it and compare it to other metrics of eelgrass health. We did that using two methods, uh, biomass collected from six US sites from the Seagrass Net Monitoring Program and also from an eelgrass health survey. Uh, and this survey was meant to be uh, a bridge uh, working with the CRE to introduce our methods and our work with them more and also to incorporate CRE understanding of eelgrass health to help calibrate the index and also to help decolonize our research. However, at the time of uh, this project and the survey, it was not possible to survey the Cree. So we adapted it to work with people in New England who had experience working with eelgrass. And we just asked participants to um, observe an image of eelgrass and then rate it from very bad to excellent. So what we found for results are here on this page in six graphs. On the x-axis, we have biomass, and on the y-axis, we have our EHI rating. All six had a positive linear trend and a significant uh, correlation. So this shows that the EHI is generally consistent in tracking with biomass in how it's working to rate eelgrass health. Um, I will uh, draw your attention to the two here on the far left, James Bay and Great Bay. Um, for the max EHI ratings, James Bay topped out around 80, while Great Bay was in the 40s. So if you wanted to compare across different sites in different areas, uh, standardization may be necessary. And then for the survey results, we had 19 participants total. Uh, they were researchers, resource managers, educators, and fishers. All had prior experience working with eelgrass, with the average being between 10 and 30 years observing it. And we used a linear mixed effects model here uh, because of the small sample size, missing responses likely due to technical issues, and to compare the effect of participants. And looking at the chart here on the left, we have participant uh, responses on the x-axis, EHI ratings on the y-axis. And if you focus on that bold line in the middle of the median, there's that nice stepwise trend all the way up through. So very bad participant responses correlated with low EHI ratings, while at the other end, if it received an excellent, it was a much higher EHI rating. So this was really encouraging. Again, a significant relationship, what we were looking for. The index is doing the same thing as what experts would expect um, when seeing it. So the eelgrass health index worked and we moved forward with applying it to the current status of eelgrass in James Bay and also comparing it to past data. And what we found when we applied it to the James Bay sites, it showed that the overall status of eelgrass health uh, in the Bay is in an impaired state with a mean rating of 27. And then when we mapped it, as seen here on the right side, um, eelgrass really was impaired throughout the entire range with only one or two isolated sites where it was persisting in a relatively healthy state. Just looking at that gradient on the map there, a red is a low rating. If it's approaching yellow, it's a moderate rating. And if it's uh, up towards blue or dark blue, it's doing really well in a healthy state. And then for reference for the next slide, I'll be focusing on this area. Um, so there was one historic paper um, from the late 1980s, early 90s that had data on this area in the northern part of James Bay. And we wanted to demonstrate how the index could be used. So we wanted to conduct a trend analysis using this historic data and our current data um, from sites here, uh, Atiquan, Kakasitook, and Tees Bay we had data for. But they only collected biomass and density. So in order to do that, again, we needed those two variables at least to plug into the index. So we put together a model here using the biomass data they collected to calculate estimated cover um, to plug into the index. And we compared those ratings um, from the historic to the ones from the present. And what we found was that at two of the sites, Atiquan and Tees Bay, eelgrass has decreased significantly, while at Kakasi took it has remained relatively stable. Um, 
this is really, um, we have more data from the past than the present. That one point is really not enough for us to say what direction eelgrass is currently heading in, whether it's still in decline, uh, stable, or if recovery is incurring. So more monitoring and data really is needed to understand the continuing trend. But it is one application of how you could use the index um, and uh, really support what's going on in James Bay. And then finally, going back here uh, to our results from our current study, uh, this site comparison was really spatial, not temporal. So um, it's a snapshot in time. It also does not reflect the overall health of uh, eelgrass in James Bay. So further monitoring is needed to really understand. And at this point, this eel, uh, research was, was from 2018. So further monitoring, like I said again, is needed. Um, and finally, the EHI is not an absolute measure. It really just reflects the information we have at hand. But there are many advantages to using this as a method as well. It's a more complete representation of eelgrass health than any single um, observ observed variable. We also it, designed it to be efficient and easy to use and uh, cost effective as well. So just to recap on what we found, uh, the eelgrass health index produces ratings consistent with accepted metrics of eelgrass assessment. The EHI is also applicable to eelgrass populations across North America based on our validation on the East Coast and West Coast sites. Also, the eelgrass health status is impaired across much of Eastern James Bay. And then compared to historic conditions from a pre previous study, eelgrass conditions have declined at two sites and persist at one. And for next steps, um, so the results from the index are to be used in an ongoing analysis of threats and stressors to James Bay, Bay eelgrass to really try and determine what is causing the decline um, to help determine what steps need to be taken to conserve eelgrass and protect the habitat that's there. Um, one of the actions being taken to get there is the Chassabee EU Resource and Research Institute, which is a Cree-based uh, research institute and is continuing to do coastal monitoring in northern James Bay of eelgrass beds, but also of fisheries, geese, and other coastal habitat. And uh, more work for me, I am working to share these methods via publication and monitoring methods. And really tying it back up, it's, uh, it's critical to understand what's happening in the bay to preserve um, these eelgrass beds, uh, the species that use them, and create traditional culture. Um, if these beds disappear and the geese go away and the fisheries go away, the Cree will have to adapt, but they're really pushing to try and find ways to make um, eelgrass stay in the bay and on the land for the current generation and future generations ahead. So with that, I would like to acknowledge that none of this would have been possible without the support of the Cree trappers and communities of James Bay. Um, they came forward with this quick a question uh, and they are focused on continuing to follow through with it. So thank you. And of course, funding uh, was provided by Niskamoon, Sea Grant, the U University of New Hampshire, uh, the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership, SeagrassNet, and EPSCOR at New Hampshire and the Future of Dams Project. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Nick. This was great. Um, audience, we will take the next five minutes to answer your questions. So please type them in the questions chat box and I will read them to Nick. Um, and just before we start uh, reading those questions, I want to remind you that Nick has provided his slides as a handout. So please feel free to download them from the handouts menu in the GoToWebinar control panel. So let's see. It looks like we have some questions for you. Uh, Nick, uh, the first question asks, it says, you mentioned that the decline was between the 1990s to the 2000s. What changed that? What changed that ended the decline? That is a great question and one I don't have an answer to. Um, one that maybe this work and working with the Cree can help uh, determine. I think that's one they'll be trying to answer at the Chassabee EU Research Institute. But I'm sorry, I, I can't give you an answer to that. 
That's all right. Um, next question. Uh, are there invasive seagrass species in this region? If so, would that skew your EHI? Great question. Not to my knowledge. All we saw was eelgrass. The only other species of seagrass up there is widgeon grass, which grows in a completely different area, uh, much more shallow environments. Um, so to date, we haven't seen any invasive species. If they were there, they potentially could um, skew it. It's very similar species like Zoster or Japonica. Um, that could definitely be an issue, but as I said before, um, we did not observe any. So uh, we don't think there are any in play at this moment. Thank you. Uh, next question asks, why was there such a gap in time of measure? Oh, probably between the historic data and the current um, analysis. That is a good question. It's a pretty difficult area to do research in, which may be one thing. Um, another is the Cree may not have been interested in having researchers come to the area. That said, the Cree first reached out in the early 2000s to uh, do eelgrass restoration. And it, the bricks kind of got pushed on that to say, let's step back and see why eelgrass is in, in decline. Because in order to do restoration, you can plant all the eelgrass you want, but if it just dies, you've, uh, you're not gonna get anywhere. But it took uh, nearly a decade to actually get that project off the ground and actually get people in James Bay working with the Cree to observe eelgrass. So there was a considerable lag time between the idea and the start of observations. I don't know if that really answers why it took so long, but that's a little background into it. Uh, yeah, I think it does. Um, next question asks, um, it says actually, I think I missed this. How did you estimate the best conditions for reference variable? No, so we took the five um, best observed conditions that we found for each variable. So highest percent cover from five different sites, the top five for density or the top five for plant height and average those and then use that as our reference. Okay. Uh, um, next question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I guess with one caveat, for percent cover, it's always just going to be 100%. You can't get any higher than that. Right. Um, this next person asks, what would it take to apply this approach to other species slash habitats? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. Um, probably some modification and thought to other species physiology and the habitats you're working in. Um, in many habitats, it might actually be easier than James Bay. Warmer water conditions where you can actually get underwater, you could still do video monitoring. Also clearer water conditions, you might be able to see more. Um, smaller, much denser plants that really grow tight together, that would take a little more consideration and something I don't have a good answer for at this time, but I think it very well could be modified to other species similar to eelgrass uh, in physiology. Wonderful. Well, this is going to be our last question. Um, so, um, this question asks a quick methods question. How accurate were the counts of shoots on images with dense eelgrass? That is a great question. Um, I will be happy to share that information. I don't have it in front of me right now, but if you want to follow up with me offline, I will definitely share the work we did on the monitoring validation. So uh, I'm punting on that one for the moment, but thank you. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much, Nick.